Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? How are you guys doing this morning? Awesome. Awesome. We are, uh, we are honored that you're here today. And um, as we all know, our nation is in uh, a turmoil right now. And um, I just want to uh, take just a few moments and uh, talk about that. I want to say welcome to everybody that's here. And uh, also all of the people who are on live stream today, we say welcome to you. We are honored that you're here and that you're joining us on live stream if you could not be here with us today. Um, as you know, our, our president called for a national day of prayer, and I'm going to take just a few moments and talk a little bit just about that before we go into uh, the message uh, today. Um, as our president gave a proclamation, I want to read that to us because I think it's very important in the time that we're in today uh, to bring light to our nation and where we are. This is the proclamation. In our times of greatest need, Americans have always turned to prayer to help guide us through trials and periods of uncertainty. As we continue to face the unique challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic, millions of Americans are unable to gather in their churches, temples, synagogues, and house of worship today. But in this time, we must not cease asking God for added wisdom, comfort, and strength as we especially pray for those who have suffered harm and those who have lost loved ones. I ask that you will join me in this national day of prayer for all people who have been affected by the coronavirus pandemic and pray that God's healing hand would be on our nation. As your president, I ask that you'll pray for the health and well-being of fellow Americans and remember there is not a problem too big for our God. 1 Peter 5 and 7, casting all of your cares on him for he cares for you. As we unite in prayer at this National Day of Prayer, we're reminded that there is no burden too heavy for our God. Luke 137, it says, With all things, in all things, God is there. One nation under God, we are greater than anything and hardship that we can face. Through prayer and acts of compassion and love, we'll rise to the challenge and emerge stronger and even more united. May God bless each of you, and may God bless the United States of America, President Donald Trump. You know, I want you to know today that in a scared world, we need people who will have faith to believe. A.W. Tozer said it this way, a scared world needs a fearless church, and we can be a fearless church. You see, we're not a people of fear, but we are people of faith. And in our minds and in our hearts, we can move from panic to peace. And I believe in the peace of God. We don't know what the next few days or the next few weeks will hold for us as a church and the church as a whole. Uh, but we do know this, that no matter what happens in the world, God is in control. God will remain in control, right? And in all of that, I want you to be comforted in knowing that the peace of God is with us. Psalm chapter 46 and 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength and is always ready to help in times of trouble. God is your refuge. There is no need to worry thinking that he is not there for us. He is there, has been there. He is not caught by surprise by what's going on. None of us know the outcome. None of us know exactly what is happening, but we do know this, that God is in control. Amen. And today, March 15th, may be a marker for many people. And as your pastors, Karen and I want you to know that we love you dearly. And our heart is that during this time that we care for you and we shepherd you through this very difficult time. Whether it be a few days, a few weeks, or an extended amount of time, we will continue to shepherd our church at whatever level that looks like, whether we're corporate gathering or not. But you must know this, we are going to lead by faith. We will not lead out of fear but by faith. Philippians chapter 4 says this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Today, we're going to pray. And as we do, we are joining with churches all around the nation and around our world Believing God for the things that we all need. And today as we pray, I, I ask if you would stand with us. We're going to spend just a moment in prayer. 
before the message comes forth. And those of you that are on live stream today, I ask that, that you will just quiet your heart, quiet your home right where you are, and just allow the peace of God to come and to speak to you today. If you would bow your hearts with us as we pray today. Father, today we pray that in this place and in this house, God, we speak peace and hope. God, we speak life today. Father, I want to offer prayer today for our nation and for our world. God, we know that you are not taken by surprise by anything that's going on. And God, no matter what the outcome of each situation may be, we know that you are in control and you will remain in control of this world. Father, I pray today for President Trump and Vice President Pence. And God, I pray for wisdom and guidance for Governor Parsons today of Missouri. Lord, I pray that you will guide every part of the decisions that they make concerning our country and concerning what's going on right now. Father, I pray for the medical staff of all hospitals and nursing homes. And, and in every area, God, we just pray your blessing upon them and their wisdom. God, we pray that you'll, you'll bless those who are affected by the virus that's going on and those that have lost loved ones, all of their families. And Father, I pray most of all today that our world would turn to God in these uncertain times. God, that our world would turn to you, knowing, God, that our strength, our hope, and our peace comes from you and you alone. Father, we thank you for the power of your word, and I pray now that as your word goes forth in this house, may it bring peace and comfort to every heart and to every life. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you look at somebody and say, I believe God's word. You may be seated. Good morning. Uh, I promise I didn't stomp at his foot. <laughs> I told him if he kept being mean to me, I was going to stomp his foot. But no. Uh, we're so glad you are here this morning. Man, what a week. <laughs> Let's just breathe out for a moment. Huh? As I was telling somebody this morning, you know, we say we have faith, we say we have faith, we say we have faith, and then we need faith, and we go all crazy, <laughs> right? Right? I also thought about the scripture this morning when Eddie was, uh, was talking is, please do this for me. If you say you're a Christ follower this morning, take this scripture and do this. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, we have the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter in our lives, and when he controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit. So this week and the weeks to come, please let your fruit be evident. What is those fruits? Love, joy. I'm talking about as we're going through this time, let's continue to have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Right? Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and by all means have self-control <laughs> at Walmart. <laughs> That's not even my message. But if you do nothing else, take that scripture with you. So the first week we are, we're in this new series called The Fringe, and, and the first week Eddie spoke to us about Zacchaeus and about experiencing God and climbing the tree right? That some of us need to climb a tree to see Jesus. And the second week, uh, Stacy did a fantastic job of speaking to us last week about finding freedom as the woman with the issue of blood, as she got down on her knees and she crawled through the crowd just to touch the hem of his garment because she needed relief. She'd had 12 years of misery. And so some of us need to push through the crowd. So today we're going to be talking from uh, about the fringe from Matthew 26, 6 through 13. But the definition of the fringe is on the edge. You're right on the cuff. You're borderline. Every one of us are on the fringe of making our next step in walking with God. Our next step walking with God. So let's turn to Matthew 26, 6 through 13. It says, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with a with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. 
And when the disciples saw it, they were indigent. They saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, he was aware of this and said, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. Now, mind you, he's got oil on top of his head as he's saying this, right? For you will always have the poor with you, but you're not always going to have me. And in pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say unto you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Here we are 2,000 plus years later and who we're talking about. Her name is Mary. So let me set up the scene for you a little bit. It's the Passover, which means that that, that is the Israelites. They're remembering of, of God bringing them out of the wilderness. You remember when they spent 40 years in the wilderness? So this is a celebration that they do. Israel is 263 miles from north to south. It's only 71 miles wide. Not very big. So here they are, and, and they say at this time in Jerusalem, the population grows five times. Okay, bear with me just for a moment. I'm going somewhere. Okay? The population grows five times more. And they begin to prepare for the Passover a month ahead. They begin to tell their kids in the synagogues, in the, in the classroom, what all the pass, uh, Passover is about. So much so that any guy that is 15 years or older has to travel to Jerusalem to be there for this. They whitewash the gravestones so that nobody will defile themselves against the grave on accident. It's a big deal. So here we are in Bethany, right? And it's just a few days that this is going to happen. But just a few days before, they were at Simon's house. Jesus rode in, and we always hear about this at Israel, Jesus, uh, at Israel, at Easter. Jesus rode in on a donkey. Remember, there was a crowd. There was a huge crowd, and they're throwing out their garments, and they're crying, Psalms 118. They're crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as he's riding through. So I'm a visual learner, so I can just imagine what's happening here. In the crowd as he's riding through on that donkey, could there have been people in that crowd that he had done miracles for. Lazarus had just freshly been raised from the dead. He was fresh out of the tomb. Just happened the day before. As he's riding, picture yourself, as he's riding on this donkey, and he looks over and he sees Lazarus. He looks over and sees Simon, the former leper, that is now hosting him, that's going to be hosting him in his home. The little boy that Jesus took his lunch and broke it and fed thousands with it. As he's riding through the crowd, maybe he's seen the deaf and the mute man that now can hear and now can speak. Maybe he saw the paralyzed man that had been lowered down through the roof that now can walk, right? Maybe he's seen Peter's mother-in-law there. She had been healed from sickness. Maybe he's seen blind Bartimaeus that now has sight and actually can see him riding in. Maybe he's seen the widow and her only son that Jesus had raised him from his deathbed. Picture with me. He's looking over the crowd. Maybe he's seen the woman that Stacy talked about last week, that touched his hem of his garment and had been healed from a bleeding disease. Maybe he looked in the crowd as he's riding through and seen the adulterous woman that he has saved from a death of stoning. So here we are, we're leading through this, and now we're at Simon the leper's house. So who's in the house? Simon the leper. Now, he had been healed of leprosy. 
He had been healed of this, this, this disease because lepers could not host people in their homes. So he had been healed of this disease, but the name still followed him. You ever feel like that God's forgave you of your sins, but you still got some names following you from your past? I have. Maybe you've had the, the past of addiction, but you still have Karen, the addiction, former addicted, right? Karen, the former molested. We still carry some of these things from our past, but here's Simon. He's, he's healed. He's had a miracle done for him. There's Lazarus there. There's Mary there. There's Judas there, and there's disciples. Can I tell you, your past is not your future. Not if you get Jesus involved. <laughs> get Jesus involved. It changes everything for you. And as we've been, been talking about the consist, consistent, that is a hard word for a southern girl. <laughs> That circle we've been talking about, as we have been moving from the crowd and the congregation to the committed, to the core, I want to talk about Mary today. She's here in verse 7, it says, a woman came up, and in John it goes on, because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the same stories, just from a different perspective. That's what the four Gospels does. And so here in John, it tells that the woman's name is Mary. But it says, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. So how do we get from being in the crowd to the congregation, to the committed, to being a, a core follower of Christ? How do we get there? First thing we got to do is be broken. If you will uh, think about an alabaster flask, it has no handles. Now, this is my alabaster flask today. It has no handles, and was, it, was, it was a long neck container. And when you needed that perfume, you had to break the flask. Mary had to break something so valuable to her. Now, in those days, for women, you was property. And if you had something expensive like this, they would wear it around their neck, underneath their garments, because it's so, to hold it so close, because that was their future. That was their investment. If they had this, that was their safety net. Can we put it that way? That was their safety net. And so here's Mary. She breaks her safety net. She breaks something that she has invested in. It's worth thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. Today it would be worth millions. And she was willing to break it because it was needed. It was very valuable. And that flask would never be the same again. The alabaster flask had to be broken before the perfume could be of any use. For me to be any use, I need things broken in my life. Pride, selfishness, addiction. I need things to be broken. And is it easy being broken? No. But it makes us useful. That perfume did not become useful until it was broken. It cost Mary something very close to her. You don't understand because when she broke this, the fear of the unknown could have taken her over. She no longer has her safety net and perfume. But she has her safety net of Christ. It cost something very close to her. And so as I told the story a while ago of Jesus riding through the crowd, and now we're at, at uh, Simon the leper's house, I want to talk to us today about miracles and about moments. Can I tell you, we need to long for more moments with him more than wanting miracles from him. 
and I'll say it again. We must, to get to the core of being a Christ follower, there's chaos in the world today, but we have a hope that when we can have peace that passes all understanding, a calm, right? That we must long more for moments with him, more than wanting miracles from him. What we have is backwards. Some of us instead want to, we long for more miracles from him. We want a miracle. We need a coronavirus miracle today. We want a miracle. But can I tell you, we must long for more moments with him. We must long for more moments with him. Here's what miracles from him do for you. You do not have to know him intimately to receive a miracle. A lot of people in the crowd didn't know him intimately, but they still was able to receive a miracle. But moments with him, you must know him intimately and intimately and personally. Miracles from him will take you from place to place. If you think about the crowds in the Bible, they went from place to place to place trying to get a miracle from him. That gave them hype. But moments with him, it places you with him, and it gives you spiritual depth. Miracles over time, we forget what he did for us. Need me to prove it? This morning, the miracle of breath in your body. By this afternoon, we are, are running for toilet paper. <laughs> right? We forget about the miracles he's done for us. But moments, it reminds us of his great love for us right. daily. Right. Miracles from him ends here on earth. Moments with him continue on through eternity. Miracles happen publicly. Moments happen privately. So we got to pour out. Be willing to be broken. The second thing is to pour out. Verse 7, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. She did not care who was around. Can I tell you, chaos was still going on around her. There were still a lot of things happening. I don't know if you realize this or not, but in two days, the one that she's pouring the oil on, he's going to be crucified. And sometimes we come in to get our Sunday hype, right? Y'all still going to love me after this, right? (laughs) And we get our worship on Sunday, but there's still chaos that happens during the week. It's still chaos that happens. And there was fixing to be something to happen. Let me put my glasses back on. She did not care who was around or what others were going to say to her or about her. All she knew, all I know, is she wanted to pour out her extravagant love to her Savior. How can I have calm during this time? (laughs) Pour out my extravagant love to my Savior. Well, what if the world shuts down? Even if it shuts down, he is still king. He is still king. It was her worship to him. When Jesus calls us into worship, he calls us into an intimate Deep, personal connection with him. And it demands nothing less than your whole self, your life. It's impossible. Eddie said this in the first week. It is impossible to be in the presence of Jesus and not be changed. Here she's pouring oil over over his head. She's pouring oil over his head. And he told her, he told the disciples, she's preparing me for my burial. I want his miracles in my life, but I must have his moments in my life more. Some of us need to pour ourselves out. 
Be willing to be broken. Be willing to be poured out. Can I tell you that crowd that cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. One day, the next day, they, was, they were crying, crucify him. And here's the point I want to make of that. Pay attention to your crowd you're hanging with. They will cause you to do things that you never thought you would do. Some of us are pouting more over what we feel God has not done for us. Some of us are pouting over what we feel God has not done for us. More than pouring out our love for him because of what he has done for us. God saved me. He's delivered me. And I am going to pour out my love for him. Do you realize that in, right here in a couple of days, the greatest miracle of all time was fixing to become a reality? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. That hadn't happened yet. It was fixing to happen. Right? I don't know. Maybe I'm just an excited one. Because of John 3.16... I can go anywhere and worship him. Before then, you had to go to the temple. But after then, I could go anywhere. I can worship him in my home. I can worship him in my car like I did this morning. I can worship him when I'm hurting. I don't have to wait to go to a specific time to the temple. He's everywhere. Some of us are pouting more over what we feel God has not done for us. <laughs> Your circumstances do not change. Your character, they reveal it. So let's go on to verse 8. And when the disciples saw it, they were very concerned and upset. I tried to say that word during rehearsal. It didn't work out so well. <laughs> they were very upset. They said, why this waste? The disciples criticized criticized this display of love and honor for Jesus, specifically Judas, according to the book of John. He said, why this waste? Isn't that crazy? Here she's, she's gave of herself. She's invested. And the very ones that were close to Christ said, why are you wasting? Just because we're doing the work of God does not mean that people's not going to be upset. Right? Then he said, why are you wasting that? Now, mind you, what they call a waste, Jesus calls a beautiful thing. Go back and look in the scripture. It says this is a beautiful thing she's doing. Now, me, I would have thought there's a, ooh, she just poured whole oil over his head. Somebody's in trouble, right? I was raised Pentecostal. I love my heritage. I love my heritage. So what they would do is, and still do, is if you had a need or you needed a miracle, you came and uh, the minister would have a, a little jar of oil. Does anybody know about this? And they would dab it on your forehead. Now, us women, we're going, I hope they don't get that in my hair. <laughs> Here she is. She's pouring the whole thing over his head. They weren't even concerned about that. They were concerned about, what a waste. And he said, no, you don't understand. This is a beautiful thing. She's, she's preparing me for my, for my burial. I find it ironic. I, I love this, what I read in the commentary. It says, Judas criticized Mary for wasting money, but he wasted his entire life. He actually left Simon's house. And went and portrayed Jesus. He had an opportunity. He could have worshipped her or worshipped him just like Mary did. But instead, he chose. So what does all of that have to do with us? In our chaotic world, worship him. Second Corinthians says 2, 14 and 15 says, Now he uses us. That's you and I. To spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. 
As you go into the world, are you that sweet smelling perfume? You know, we were just, we had the awesome privilege of being in Cancun last week. We got to go with some pastor friends of ours. That, and every, as soon as you walked into that, onto that resort, you smelled a sweet perfume. The fragrance was Actually, we all walked in. We said, oh, I love that smell. So much so that anywhere you walked on that resort, and it was huge, anywhere, even in the bathrooms, <laughs> had the same fragrance. Can I tell you, as a Christ follower, are you carrying that fragrance, fragrance with you everywhere? Are you carrying the fruits of the Spirit with you yeah. everywhere? In good times, in bad times, in ugly times, we all have them. But are you displaying those fruits? Mary was preparing for his burial with her worship. We are now preparing for his returning with our worship. We're not preparing for his burial anymore. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but he's, he's not dead. He's alive. So we need you to discover your purpose. What's your purpose? Worshiping him. In 2017, Eddie and I were able to go to Mount St. Helens and Mount, Saint, uh, Mount Rainier, and, and I just so happened to come across this in my journal the other day and here's what I wrote God spoke these majestic mountains and beauty into existence but he went a step further with Adam and Eve and you and I he created Adam and Eve into existence with his very own hands and with the very same breath that he spoke these mountains into existence, he then blew into Adam and Eve's lungs. That breath that is so powerful, enough that is able to speak mountains into existence, is also gentle enough to breathe life and to you and I. And you think you have no purpose? I love what Lisa Singh says. She said, God does not create anything insignificant, inferior, or without a purpose. Life is more than just passing through to get to a better place. I'm not just passing through life to get from Monday to Saturday. Even though that will be the end result, we have to believe that life is so much more and that the reason we were put on earth is not just to do the time, not just to come to church, or just to buy time but to accomplish something with our life in the time we have been given. You were created on purpose. Can I tell you, you're not an accident. Some of you may have been told all your life, you're an accident. I think I read somewhere on Facebook the other day where somebody was in a store and, and, and a dad couldn't buy, but half of what he wanted to in alcohol and he turned to his little son and says I, I hate you sometimes he's not an accident can I challenge us to get personal with God he knows everything about you anyway One of the things that when I realized that I was going to be speaking and, and 
Can I tell you this message has been on my heart for a year and God knew the time. God knew the time. And so I asked Rick, our worship leader today, and I asked him, I said, listen, at the, during my message, could you come up and sing this song for me? Because I want it to be Maybe some of you walked in here differently, but I want you to leave differently as well. I want you to lay everything aside. The world's going to be out there when you get there, okay? I want you to lay everything aside, and I want this to become your prayer as they lead us into this song. Would you stand with me this morning?